Good morning, everyone. People are still joining the webinar, so we're going to give it just a few more minutes before we get started. Good morning. On behalf of the U.S. Wind Professional Development Committee, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Tamara Baker, the U.S. Wind Professional Development Chair. We are recording this webinar and it will be uploaded to the U.S. Wind Professional Development Library within the next few days for your use. So every, March, every year, March is designated as Women's History Month to honor women's contributions in American history. And this year's theme is celebrating the women who tell our stories. To celebrate the contributions and achievements of women in the nuclear field, U.S. Wind has crafted a series of professional development events. Last Friday, Maria LaCalle, who is the featured U.S. Wind member spotlight this month, kicked off Women's History Month and shared her story about the importance of building your personal board of directors. And today, we are celebrating Tara Nider, and Carol Lane and their stories in designing first of a kind reactor technology and working with the Department of Energy and Congress to advance this innovative technology. So with that, please allow me to introduce our speakers and Stephanie Buster, our moderator. Our first speaker today is Tara Nider. Tara has more than 30 years of experience in nuclear engineering, project management, and licensing. She is the senior vice president at Terra Powder, excuse me, Terra Power, where she leads the company's efforts in the Natrium Reactor Project as part of the Department of Energy's Advanced Reactor Program. She and her team are responsible for plant design, testing, licensing, design integration, procurement, and project leadership and administration. Before jo joining Terra Power, Tara served in several senior management positions for Areva, including Senior Vice President of Backend Business Development and Sales of Areva Inc. and President and CEO of Areva's Federal Services. Most of Tara's career was with Transnuclear, where she started out as a project manager and design engineer and worked her way up to President and CEO. 
Tara holds bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and an MBA in finance and international business from New York University. Our second speaker is Carol Lane. Carol has more than 20 years of experience in the government and private sector, working on energy, civilian space, and national security policy. She is vice president of government affairs at X-Energy, where she works with Congress and the executive branch to advance the company's objectives in nuclear reactors and fuel design. Before joining X-Energy, Carol served in several senior management positions for Ball Aerospace and Technologies, including Vice President of Washington Operations and Vice President of Civil and Commercial Space. Carol has extensive experience working with both the legislative and executive branch. And interestingly, she was a presidential appointee in the Reagan administration as a director in the Department of Transportation. Carol is a graduate of George Washington University and is currently the president of the American Astronautical Society and a mentor for the Brooke Owens Foundation. And our moderator today is Stephanie Buster. Stephanie is the Assurance Manager in the Office of Audit, Risk, and Compliance at Duke University. Prior to joining Duke, she served in several leadership positions at North Carolina State University and held positions with the U.S. Department of State, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, and the District of Columbia Government Administration. Stephanie has her bachelor's degree from Howard University, dual master's degrees from Middlebury College and Middlebury Institute of International Studies, Juris Doctorate from the University of Wisconsin, and Diploma of Education in International Nuclear Law from the University of Montpelier. Stephanie is co-chair of the U.S. Wind Professional Development Strength and Subcommittee and will assume the position of chair of the American Nuclear Society Nuclear Proliferation Policy Division this June. Please help me in welcome, welcoming our guest today as I turn this over to Stephanie Buster. Thank you, Tamara. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first session in our 2023 technical webinar series. As Tamara mentioned, my name is Stephanie Buster, and I'm a member of the Professional Development Strength and Subcommittee. I'd like to go over a few quick administrative items before we begin. Today's session, as you might already know, is fully virtual and will be 90 minutes long. The first part of the session will include include 20 to 30 minute presentations from each of our panelists. Um, and we will take a few questions immediately following each presentation, but there will be a longer question and answer period toward the end of the session. Uh, after that, um, our committee chair, Tamara, will take a few minutes to close us out. Uh, as you already probably know as well, all audience members um, are muted by the ses session administrator. But for the Q&A portion, audience members can do one of two things. You can either type your questions in the chat box, or you may use the raise hand feature um, within Zoom. And if time permits, our meeting administrator will unmute you so that you can actually voice your own questions. Um, and we'll try to get through as many of those as possible, but you are encouraged to uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, as well. At this point, I'd like to open the floor to Tara Nider to share her com comments. Thank you, Eunice, and um, or thank you, Tamara. And um, I wanted to, oh, let me get my slides up here. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay, great. Um, I'm as 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 uh, was mentioned, I'm Tara Nider, and I am running the Natrium program at TerraPower. Uh, TerraPower is a company that was founded by Bill Gates um, about a dozen years ago, um, and really focused on trying to provide power uh, around the world uh, to people um, in need. Um, and that has kind of morphed over um, many years into really trying to solve uh, climate change and uh, nuclear, as we all know, is a big part in, in resolving the um, uh, climate change issues that we face today. Um, in yeah. addition to the next, yeah. yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, we can see your note slide. So I need you to go ahead and click on display setting mm -hmm. and um, just switch it. Yeah, swap. How's that? 
Second? Um, no, it still didn't do it. Try it again. Right. I sense that it didn't work. Yes. It did not? It did not. And right, I'm going to try again. How's that? It looks, yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, anyway, I was saying that TerraPower, in addition to the Natrium program, uh, we also are developing a molten chloride fast reactor, the MCFR, um, and we're doing a, um, a demonstration uh, uh, test experiment at Idaho National National Labs for the um, McCree or Molten Chloride Reactor Experiment, as well as uh, we're working on um, developing medical isotopes. So we have a lot going on um, at TerraPower, but for today, I'm going to focus on the natrium reactor. All right, it's not forwarding now. There we go. Um, so just to give you a quick uh, project overview, our objective is to design, license, construct, and operate the Natrium Commercial Demonstration Plant. Um, the US site was determined in year one and, uh, and we chose to license the plant under 10 CFR Part 50. Uh, un, under the governance of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. In addition to the, um, to the plant itself, the project also includes uh, supporting the initial development of HALU, uh, HALU enrichment facility, that was Centris. Uh, we design, also design licensing and construction of a CAT2 HALU fuel fabrication facility, which is going to be located in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina um, and, and run by Global Nuclear Fuel. Um, the initial core load and strengthening of the of the nuclear supply chain. Um, in addition, um, we are um, continuing our development of advanced fuel that um, that uh, really improves the amount of time that the fuel can stay in the reactor, uh, which greatly uh, reduces the amount of waste and uh, obviously increases the value of that fuel. We have a lot of team members. Um, GE Hitachi and TerraPower are, are the primary design team. Bechtel is doing the design of our energy island and our um, and will be our constructor. We have virtually all of the nuclear national labs working on this project, mostly in the development of, commercial, of computer codes and, um, and uh, support of our fuel development activities. Uh, we also have a number of, um, of utilities that are supporting us. Uh, Pacific Corp will be the owner operator of the plant, um, but Energy Northwest and Duke Energy are providing a lot of insights uh, where we could only get that from, from utilities. Uh, we also have Arano on our team, which is helping us on the, um, the fuel handling activities. Uh, this is a um, depiction of our plant. We also have a great 3D model. If you ever get to uh, come to our site, you could run through the entire plant. Uh, but what you see here is, um, is two separate areas. The area that's uh, um, in, the, in the orange um, square is the reactor island and around that is in blue is the energy island. And what we did is we, we separated the nuclear island and the energy island so that we could uh, reduce costs. The only thing running between the nuclear island and the energy island is salt piping, which basically takes heat from the reactor and, um, and that salt, that heated salt, if you will, is stored in those energy storage tanks. Um, and then that, that heat from the, the salt itself actually is used to run the steam generators, um, steam generators and turbines to produce electricity. What this does is allows the NRC to focus on the things that are safety, safety related or safety significant, uh, and which are all on the nuclear island and the rest of the, the energy island can actually be built commercial grade. And I'll go into a little bit more detail um, uh, uh, detail on another slide. Um, first off, I wanted to talk about the storage tanks. Um, these storage tanks are really important for us because it allows us to keep the nuclear reactor operating at a steady state without, um, without putting any additional stress on the reactor from uh, going up and down in power. But, but the turbines can actually um, 
run at higher higher um, higher power or lower power depending on on what the need on the grid is. So the the um, what what essentially happens is these tanks the as as you need power the um, hot tank um, basically. Um, goes into the steam generators producing the electricity and then it's recycled into the coal tank and, and then that goes back to the reactor. Um, and this, these salt tanks can, can really accommodate any amount of energy storage that you want. Um, and we are only using one hot tank and one coal tank at the demonstration reactor. But uh, essentially what this does is, is you can increase the nominal um, power of your reactor by about 50%. Our nominal, react, nominal reactor is 345 megawatts. We can go up flex up to 500 megawatts for a period of about five and a half hours, or we can go down to as low as 100 megawatts uh, because we have these, these tanks in between the, the uh, power producer and, um, and then the electricity producer, the heat versus the electricity, I should say. And you can increase the number of turbines or increase the number of steam generators, depending on how much storage and how much power you need. This is a view of the um, of the nuclear island, a cross section. Um, and what you see is that the reactor is um, all of the um, safety related equipment is underground. So you've got the reactor, um, and inside of the reactor is um, essentially your um, your um, sodium pump, your, um, your heat exchangers, and all of the primary loop is actually in the reactor itself. And there are no penetrations um, into, into the core other than through the, um, through the head of the reactor. Um, the reactor is um, a sodium fast reactor. So it's running at higher temperatures than, um, than uh, the normal uh, light water reactors. Uh, but the uh, but the pressure is near atmospheric, so you don't have a driving force to try to um, expand the reactor and put pressure on the reactor. This is actually all at very near ambient pressure. Um, out of the out of the head of the reactor flows sodium, and then that sodium goes to a um, a uh, sodium salt heat exchanger where the sodium heats up the salt, and then that salt flows out to the to the energy island. Um, one of the really unique things about this, this reactor is that you have a, a big cavity between the, the reactor vessel and, um, and uh, the, the structure around it. And that, that um, cavity, if you will, actually allows heat to rise up through, um, through the reactor auxiliary board um, building through the reactor air cooling decks that you can see here. And all of the uh, decay heat from the reactor can be, um, be removed um, passively without any operator activity or any, um, any electric, um, external electric uh, power. So that is just natural and that was proven on um, EBR2 um, in 1976, I believe. Um, in addition to the reactor itself, you also have um, the spent fuel pool. The fuel is stored in water. We have a 10-year storage period, and then, then they would be transferred to on-site storage uh, uh, until, until a repository is, is developed. Uh, let's see. So um, what really impresses me about the natrium reactor is its safety features, because all of the safety features are, are um, what I'd call inherent or natural. Um, the control um, control is very similar to what you'd see in a like in a PWR reactor, where you have control rods that drop down into the into the core um, in order to uh, in order to uh, reduce the um, uh, crit uh, to to, re to go to subcrit subcriticality. Um, we have a motor driven control rod run back, and um, if if there's a scram, it's actually the rods are gravity driven, so they drop into into place naturally. The big difference between um, the light water reactor and the um, and the natrium is that uh, the natrium is very very sensitive um, to to uh, the control rods. So the actually the control rods actually only have to go in a couple of inches uh, rather than all the way into the core in order to uh, have its have its effect. Um, in addition. Um, we have uh, 
13 control rods and actually only one or two would have to drop in in order for um, to um, to stop the the, the critical react, reactor activity. Um, so uh, in addition, cooling, as I mentioned, the uh, there's the in-vessel primary sodium heat trans transport. Everything is uh, inside the vessel. It's kind of uh, congested in there because we do put everything in there. But what's what's nice about that is there aren't any leakage paths. You don't have to worry about pipes leaking sodium and such because everything, all of the radioactive sodium stays inside of the reactor. Um, and um, because um, the reactor air cooling is natural draft flow, flow, it's always on. So you don't actually have to um, open up a damper in order to, um, to, or do something like that in order to get this going. It's, it's, it, it is always, it is always uh, on. And as your temperature increases, because the um, cooling goes by a factor of four, uh, uh, yes, um, exponent of four, that uh, actually at the higher temperatures, it actually cools more. So, um, so it uh, um, actually works very nicely. And then from a containment standpoint, because we have low primary and secondary pressure, there really isn't any driving force to, um, to move radionuclides um, away. Uh, sodium also has a natural affinity for radionuclides, wanting to retain, those, um, retain the, uh, uh, the radionuclides inside of the reactor. So everything is very simple. It's uh, based on US SFR experience. So with the EBR1, EBR2, FFTF, and TREAT. Um, the, really the big difference for us on, on Natrium is that we were able to um, take the um, designs of the, uh, of the uh, early efforts of the national labs and, um, and, and US government and actually make it a commercial um, commercial reactor. And we did that by really trying to keep everything very, very simple. I'll give you a little bit of information about where we are on the demonstration program. Uh, we did select um, Kemmerer, Wyoming as, as the site. Kemmerer is, um, is the site of uh, a number of uh, coal plants that are scheduled to shut down. What was really important is we were not going in there saying we want to shut down your coal plants, but we, we went in there saying since the decision has been made that the coal plants would be shut down, it would make sense for a nuclear plant to, to, um, to come in and take its place. The, um, I can't tell you how wonderful the people of Kemmerer have been. Um, they are... Um, you know, we're facing a situation where their main livelihood of all the people in the town have um, was the coal plant and and the associated coal mine um, next door, um, and this gives kind of a new life to the community. And we've seen um, a tremendous amount of uh, of development already in Kemmerer because because we are going there. Um, we had the uh, all of the evaluation of the site, the geotechnical evaluations, is all completed, um, and we are in the process of licensing the the plant. Um, we are following our regulatory engagement plan, and we have submitted several topical reports and white papers uh, for the NR for NRC review at this point. In fact. Um, we did submit a topical report on the separation of the energy island and the nuclear island, which is kind of one of our key features. Um, and the NRC is um, is doing an audit of that now, expecting to close that out in, in uh, two days. Um, and they have no no findings on that. So um, I think that's that they they uh, are agreeing with our position on the separation. So it's quite good. Um, we did do a design review for readiness for preliminary safety analysis um, in, in October of last year. Uh, we did have a number of areas where we chose to take a little bit extra time and we expect to complete those. Um, they're ongoing now and we expect completion in April. This is a view of the site itself. Um, we had a lot of drills on site. We had did 109 borings um, in the deepest borehole, which is at the center of the reactor, was 1,500 feet deep. Um, some of this work was done in pretty severe conditions. Camera is very cold in the winter time, uh, and uh, uh, and it's quite windy. So uh, the people did a wonderful job. But what we found was the site was a great site for a nuclear plant. Um, the um, 
everywhere we uh, we drilled, it was a very consistent story. There was 20 feet of soil, 30 foot of weathered rock, and hard rock below 50 feet. So very, very uniform, and it's excellent to build a nuclear power station there. By the way, we did choose to put the site um, a, near the nucle near the coal plant as opposed to at the coal plant. Um, so we're still able to get the water from that the coal plant was using and we're able to use the transmission lines, but we chose to go a little bit away, a couple miles away from the plant. And the reason for that was we didn't wanna be subject to any environmental issues associated with um, the coal plant. And uh, you know, there is a number of uh, ash ponds there and and there has been have been some spills so we didn't want to have to take that on so um, using a, a clean site was much better um, one of the things i didn't realize would we would do so much was community engagement it's it's really really important uh, we've had numerous county and city outreach meetings we work with the um, governor of, of the state of wyoming quite a lot um, and, uh, and we've also reached out to the, the to um, both the local tribes and the national tribes uh, that have had an interest in that area. Um, we've had re continuous requests for speaking engagements. Um, and uh, essentially, you know, it, if you listen to the people, it's it's really interesting. You know, they are concerned with the right things. They're concerned about what the number, all the people coming on site is going to go going to do to this uh, small community. They're worried about their uh, waste treatment center. Uh, do they need to have um, increase in the in you know, basically renovation of the wastewater treatment facility. Um, they're worried about water. Um, so talking through these things, um, living places for people to live during construction is another big one because this is a, a pretty uh, small local community. So we are uh, working through all that. And, uh, and we, again, we continue to have very positive engagement with the community. Our plans licensing dates uh, for our fuel facility is uh, we are submitting our application in October of 2023. Um, and then for the plant itself, we are submitting our construction permit application in February of 2024. Um, we have worked with the NRC on the timing of their review. Um, and so the July 2026 date is a date which includes their acceptance review, the actual review of the, of the, um, the uh, PSAR and um, environmental uh, application, as well as uh, four months of commissioner review at the same time. That was one area where we didn't anticipate those four, four extra months, but we've accommodated that, that in our schedule now. Our operating license um, application will be submitted in September of 2027, and um, the license will be approved by NRC in uh, March of 2030. Um, and one thing we did do is we did extend our schedule by two years, which uh, put, gave us some relief in terms of the um, design and licensing schedule. But the main main driver for that was the lack of HALU availability. We, our fuel does use high assay, low enriched uranium. Uh, and because of the uh, um, invasion of the Ukraine, we are not going to get this um, material from Russia. And um, and actually, we never anticipated getting um, material from Russia other than for the first core, because there is a, a pretty significant effort the Department of Energy is doing to build the HALU capability in the United States now. Uh, but that wasn't going to be in time for, for our first, first load. Um, and so now um, uh, we are delaying the project a little bit just um, so that we do have time to um, use US developed HALU. Um, so that's just a really quick overview of of uh, of natrium. Uh, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit now, kind of change course a little bit on talk about challenges with nuclear innovation, and then kind of my own personal perspectives of being a, a woman um, in a pretty predominantly male um, industry. So um, the first challenges with nuclear innovation is of course the regulations. Um, they're written for light water reactors. The NRC is in, the, in a pretty significant um, uh, time of flux. And uh, so the requirements are changing and that's probably the worst time to go in and, and get a license just because you, you have to assume what the license, um, what the requirements will be when you submit while you, uh, uh, you don't have any um, 
assurance that they will stay that way. Um, also, the regulators might be unfamiliar with the type of the new reactor design being licensed. All of the, the, the previous sodium fast reactors were all licensed um, through the Department of Energy, um, and the NRC is not so familiar with them. We've now given them three different training classes um, to familiarize them with the, um, with the um, design, and um, in addition to our regular um, meetings with the NRC. Um, uh, there's really no room for mistakes. So everything has to be systematically testing, tested and that takes a lot of time. So we are building prototypes. Um, so not only are we building the plant, but we have the equipment in the plant, we have to prototype that, test those prototypes and then build the, um, the uh, production equipment. Um, and you have to have a supply chain that believes that the new reactors will be a successful new market. Um, we, I think, the industry really believes that uh, advanced reactors and, and small modular reactors um, are needed and this, this business will develop, um, but because there aren't um, you know, dozens of orders out there, um, you know, the supply chain has to be enticed to actually support the development of this new equipment. Um, and the US supply chain is undeveloped. Um, the other thing in, in TerraPower is, um, is uh, in a very good position because of this is patient capital is required because there's a long time period between design initiation to an operating plant. Um, and uh, I have to say our capital um, investors have been extremely patient with us. Um, and, and then finally the customer, um, and no one wants to be the first utility to try out a first of a kind reactor. They want to, to um, go, um, and be the second or maybe the fifth, but not the first. And uh, so, so it is difficult and we are working with a regulated utility and our agreement with that regulated utility is that um, they're not going to have to take the construction risk, we are. Um, and, but um, those assurances are, are pretty steep and uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is a challenge uh, with the risk being so lopsided on one side. Um, as part of the demonstration reactor, because we do have a fixed timeline to get this all done, uh, we did have to make tough decisions based on risk. Um, you know, some of our um, the things that we wanted uh, is part of the design are listed here, um, and the ones that have green checks next to it are those that we decided were extremely important and we would implement as part of the demonstration. That includes the nuclear island, energy island separation, um, minimizing the amount of safety related equipment and putting those underground, um, implementing our advanced fuel technology um, and salt storage. Um, there were other, other things that we want to do which will um, enhance the uh, or reduce the cost of the plant. Um, or um, may make the operations more efficient. Uh, however, uh, we chose to, um, to not include them because we um, uh, didn't have the time to do so, but we continue that development um, uh, as kind of a sideline, uh, but they won't be implemented in the, in the first reactor. And those include the elimination of the intermediate sodium loop, that's the uh, sodium to salts loop, um, and then, uh, compact heat exchangers. Um, and finally, electromagnetic pumps were a part of our design originally, but what we found was the, the efficiency drops uh, dramatically with the, with the pumps. And in the event that the electromagnetic pumps would, um, uh, if there was problem with the electromagnetic pumps, we wouldn't be able to find that out until late in, in our design. And, uh, and uh, we didn't wanna take that chance. Uh, finally, I just want to say about the project is uh, bigger than what, was, what we what we ever expected. Um, we expected all the things that I've been talking about: the siting, the environmental assessments, the community, community engagement, the design, licensing, development of our fuel, getting a standard fuel contract, um, initial funding for the Centris enrichment facility, developing operating programs and procedures, and training plant staff. However. <laughs> In addition to all of those things, uh, we ended up taking on a lot of the work that the utility would, we expected the utility to do, including um, the interconnectivity application, which is a pretty, pretty big effort, um, uh, upgrade of the water intake structure, um, 
uh, we are now purchasing the land and obtaining all the easements for the for the property. Um, uh, we're and and we're actually going to be the utility until we transfer the for the license, which you know changed things dramatically. Um, another thing we did was um, we we felt that some of our equipment needed to be tested at full scale, and there was no sodium test facility that in the world that could do that. Uh, Japan came closest. Uh, but Japan needed to develop the sodium loop. Uh, so we decided to actually build our own test facility and that's gonna be adjacent to the Kemmerer site. Um, and that's, uh, so that'll be actually our first construction on site and uh, the uh, clearing of the site for that will start um, hopefully this fall. Um, and, then, and then finally, aside from all the project work, um, you know, it, jumping from a, a small project to a to a huge project uh, very quickly kind of puts us some stress on our system. Um, so we've had a lot of work to do upgrading our process and procedures so that we can accommodate this multi-company effort. Um, a big effort has been put into data management development, um, and then uh, I think compliance with NRC and DOE regulations throughout the company was kind of something that. Um, I think a lot of us understood being in the nuclear and in nuclear industry most most of our careers, but um, I, I, you know, getting that to everyone has been um, uh, kind of an interesting battle. Um, we have endless financial audits, um, the DCA accounting audits and stuff. It just seems to go on endlessly, and uh, so kind of hurts, kind of takes our finance uh, people away from the other work that they'd be doing. Um, and then we've had to put in systems and processes for monitoring performance because the project is so big um, that you can't can't tell what's going on unless you do that. Um, and really developing the safety culture for the for the uh, company as a whole. We're taking a lot of people, uh, growing our staff very quickly, and a lot of these people have never been in an, in in the nuclear industry previously. So uh, it's been a wild ride. But I must say that this is the best job I've ever had. I, I just love it. It's so complex, but uh, so interesting and so rewarding. Um, so some keys to success, and I'll, I'll shut down pretty quickly here. Uh, first of all, flexibility. We have to have the ability to hire the appropriate staff. We have to um, have a, a decision-making process that weighs opportunity and risk. And we have to recognize that we can't do it alone. Um, this is too big for any one company to do. Um, and the one I haven't read there because I think we're, we're not doing enough of is getting others to share the risk with us. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about personal perspectives. I've, um, I think I've been very successful in my career in the nuclear industry. I've run a couple companies. I've um, now got this uh, multi-billion dollar um, project that uh, is going well. Um, and so I just wanted to share, you know, the most important thing is really surround yourself with smart people. The people who work for me are way more intelligent than me, and I'm happy about that. Um, one thing I did learn, because I've messed up on this in the past, is you have to run the project such that your departure will not result in a significant perturbation um, in the overall program. Uh, you've got to have all those people in the wings that are, that are moving up in the organization. Um, have people stay in their swim lanes to make sure that they're doing their job um, and let others do their jobs um, and learn uh, ensure alignment between stakeholders. Um, it's really easy to get off track here. Um, and then, of course, communicate, communicate, communicate. I think I have this <laughs> so many times on this list because it's so important. Um, and listen to everybody, but make your own decisions. Um, and then... Um, probably most important is make sure that your project team trusts you so that they're not, uh, they, that they will tell you what you can't see from your position. Um, I, I think that's probably, if I was to put just one thing down, that's probably the, the most important. Um, you have to lead by example and you have to have the folks uh, trust you. And then lastly, um, you know, having, uh, been in the nuclear industry my entire career. Um, and it's, you know, I, I was a, um, when I was a young engineer, I really had, well, actually even in high school, you know, my, my father told me when I got a little card in the mail saying, um, you're invited to some MIT open house or something. He says, you're gonna go there. 
<laughs> and I didn't even know what it was, right? So I I went through my career fairly oblivious to what was what was uh, you know my my overall ambition in my career. It kind of just things just happened. Um, I wasn't really um, looking for the next job. I was always trying to do what I could in my current position um, before asking for another one. Um, so so um, you know you just have to make sure you set a good example of what you want your people to be doing. Um, and recognize that the higher up in an organization that you are, the more your behaviors and activities are going to be scrutinized. I know everybody in the company knows which car is mine out in the parking lot. You know, they know when I come in and in during, you know, in the morning when I leave at night, you know, so, so uh, you have to always be aware that you need to set that example for the team. Um, and speak up when you when you see that things are, are um, unfair. I, I don't have to do that very often. I think I've been blessed with working in companies that have, have been very, very fair companies, um, but there are inequities and oftentimes those do go on gender lines. And um, so when you see that, speak up, don't be afraid um, and seek work that you enjoy. And that's all I have, so thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, that was a lot. And I will say we are going to take, take time for one question here. And then um, you do have quite a few questions, Tara. I will let you know that. <laughs> but we're going to save most of those um, till the end, uh, the longer question and answer period, so that we give, um, we give Carol a chance to speak. Um, and so the first question we have for you, Carol, is from Paul Jensen. Um, and just so that you know, in the audience, I'm going straight down the list here. Um, and the question is, can the thermal storage tanks be added to current nuclear plants? They could, um, but they're not going to be as good for the current nuclear plants. And the reason is the, um, the molten, molten salt that we use uh, has a temperature range that's very compatible with the sodium fast reactor. Um, and that just happens to be, we took that from the, the um, um, concentrated solar industry. And so, so it's kind of a perfect match for us. For the, um, for the um, light water reactors, you would have to put, you know, amp up the temperature uh, with addi additional um, energy, which uh, doesn't make it as good, uh, but it certainly could be done. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Tara. And we will come back to a few questions, a few more questions for you. But at this time, I'd like to um, open the floor for Carol to uh, share her presentation with the group. If we're ready for that. And uh, while we're setting that up, audience, thank you so much for your uh, questions. And um, please just keep them coming and we will try to get to them at the end of both of these presentations. So I see Carol's got her presentation up here and I will go ahead and mute. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, um, I think Chair ended with a little bit about herself. I'm gonna start with that. Um, I actually started at X Energy in 2015 when I started there. Uh, there were about 12 of us. And um, this week we actually just topped 420 people and are continuing to go quite rapidly. Um, my career development has really been up through a business development policy legislative uh, ladder. And um, it's been quite interesting. I started on the uh, Hill working for a senator from New Mexico as an energy legislative assistant. And actually the first hearing I had to put together was on nuclear waste. So I was known in our office as Miss Nuclear Waste. Not the most attractive uh, a title, but anyway, it was fun. Um, I then moved to the Senate Commerce Committee and really focused on space issues as my uh, the senator I worked for became chairman of that committee. And so uh, when I left the Hill, I went off and spent 25 years in the um, aerospace industry. And when I ended my last job there, um, Cam Gaffarian, who's our founder, asked me to come talk to him. I knew him from the aerospace side. And um, I really had was not set to come work for him, but I sat and talked to him 
for about two hours and listen to his vision of what he expected out of X Energy and how he thought as a company we were going to change the world through nuclear energy. And I signed up and I've been here ever since. So it's been a wild ride, but it's just been an incredible time to join um, the industry. And you go to the next chart, please. Um, so just a minute about Cam. Um, he's a he's not very well known outside of um, a very small circle, but he's really an incredible guy to work for. He's a he's a serial entrepreneur. He started his first company in 1994, which was Stinger Gafarian Technologies, and he grew that with a partner, basically from the basement of his house to a 650 million dollar company and became NASA's second largest engineering support services company, um, and then sold it to KBR in 2018. Um, what he did keep uh, were three startup companies that he started kind of around the same time with X Energy being the first in 2009, um, and then two space companies, Intuitive Machines and Axiom. Um, X Energy was really interesting. He and his partner started a school in the Congo and he and his partner had gone there and it was really, he saw firsthand what it was like not to have electricity and what it does to the standard of living and came back and said he wanted to give back and he really wanted to make a difference in being able to pro provide electricity to the almost billion people in the world that don't have it. Um, so he was really inspired by that mission and that passion to do something. And um, it grabbed me and it grabbed a lot of us who started working for CAM early on. Um, so uh, he was not tied to any particular technology when he started the company and decided that nuclear energy was the path he wanted to take. He did have a number of advisors and um, through a lot of discussion and um, uh, analysis, he ended up deciding that the high temperature gas cooled reactor was the most mature and closest to maybe get to market. And that really is what drove him to choose the high temperature gas cooled reactor technology. The next chart. Um, so I talked about our growth a little bit in terms of numbers. Um, and we really are in three business areas. I'm going to focus primarily on the XC100, which is our commercial grid scale reactor. Um, but early in 2015, 16, we decided we really, fuel is such a key component of our reactor that we really needed to be in control of our destiny for fuel. And so we, um, hired a couple of people and competed for one of the advanced reactor uh, concept technology um, com, uh, com, uh, cooperative agreements and were selected to one, for one. And I'll talk about that really influenced our ability to grow and um, be able to build a commercial manufacturing facility uh, to make triso fuel. And then the third area that we are focused on is government R&D. And I'll talk about that at the end in terms of some alternative reactors that we're looking at um, to our grid scale reactor. Next chart. Uh, just a little bit of our timeline. As I said, Cam started the company in 2009. And because he chose the high temperature gas technology, he really ended up going to South Africa and being connected with the core team that built the pebble bed reactor in South Africa and brought a number of those, probably a half dozen to a dozen of those guys over to this country. And that really formed the initial core of our technical team. Um, and then I mentioned when we started building up the fuel component of it. And then in 2019, 2021, we really started to make the transition to focus on what does it really take to make this a commercial, affordable, um, sustainable enterprise um, with bringing on Clay Sell as the CEO uh, of X Energy. And most of the rest of this on there, I'm gonna talk to later. So um, let's uh, go ahead to the next chart. 
for those of you that are not aware, uh, HTGR technology is not new. We are capitalizing on a, both a lot of investment from the federal government, as well as previous reactors that have been built and operated. Um, in fact, the um, HTGR concept was really started at Oak Ridge National Lab in about 1944 uh, by Farrington Daniels. And um, he is also the father of the solar, known as the father of solar energy as well. Um, but it's got a lot of heritage um, and therefore also a lot of lessons learned, which we've tried to incorporate into our XC100. And, um, you know, and then, as I said, leverage the, what was the NGNP program, the Next Generation Nuclear Power Program, you know, which the government spent between five and $700 million, um, both on the reactor design, as well as testing, uh, manufacturing and testing the fuel and uh, doing the post irradiation analysis. So that really is the basis of a lot of our licensing activity as well. Uh, next chart. So I always start with uh, the pebble because this is really the core of our safety case. And um, it is about this size, the size of a billiard ball. And inside um, this billiard ball uh, pebble is about 17,000 what we call um, particles. Those particles are about the size of chia seeds. And basically the testing was on the particles at um, Idaho National Lab. And what they did find is that um, after irradiation, the particles retain 99.999% of fissile material. And so that really is um, the core of our safety and where the fission products are um, remain. And then the pebble then becomes what might be in a conventional reactor, the uh, containment building. And so it's a very different way of looking at um, reactors and at the safety case. So we then take 200, about 220,000 pebbles. They, they are put into our reactor core. You can think of it as uh, like a guy, giant gumball machine because the, the pebbles start at the top of the reactor and move down to the bottom of the reactor. Um, we continually fuel our reactor. So each day, about 77 pebbles uh, come out of the reactor. We test them to see how much uh, fuel is burned. If there's still fuel to burn left in the pebble, it gets recycled to the top of the reactor. If the fuel is all spent inside, uh, it goes into our, our fuel storage. Um, generally, a pebble will go through the reactor about six times and takes about six months to get through the reactor core. We um, flow helium gas over our reactor pebble bed, and it's the helium gas that's heated and goes over to the steam generator and the turbine and um, uh, provides either electricity or steam. Next chart, please. Um, so um, one of the things that I think Tara mentioned this also that we've spent a lot of time on in terms of trying to figure out how do we make nuclear energy affordable and scalable and achievable on shorter timeframes than we've done in the past. <laughs> so similar to uh, what Tara talked about, we also have what we call a, a nuclear island and conventional island. And we did it for the same reasons that she talked about. On the conventional island side, it allows you to use a lot more of commercially available equipment, like for the turbines and the steam generator, which are very, um, which really uh, play a major role in the uh, actual costs of the um, plant itself. We also have made the decision to make sure everything is shippable um, by truck. Um, so that's what focused us on the size of the module. So we do four modules is really our ideal economic plant for a 300 megawatt plant. And um, as opposed to building one big one, the Chinese actually have just commissioned their uh, high temperature gas cooled reactor and pebble bed reactor. And they do use a very large core um, that they need a special crane for and you know, while the technology is the same, 
from a logistical standpoint, it doesn't provide the economics that um, doing things more modularly and commercially does that we hope to make for um, uh, hopefully a fleet of plants in the future. Uh, next slide thing. So we, um, a couple of things that we focused on very early on, one of them was uh, constructability in our constructors. If we look back at the history, particularly more recent history of building uh, nuclear plants, the cost of construction has been very expensive in constructability. And so we have engaged with contractor, construction contractors actually back through the 2018 timeframe um, we did go through a very formal process this year to a uh, competition actually, where we put out an RFP for, con for um, constructors. We had a number of uh, submittals and ended up deciding to select two contractor teams. One is a uh, Zachary group and the other is a team of Burns and McDonald and Dan Zimmerman. Um, we were very set on having at least two contractors, uh, constructors for it. And I'll talk a little bit about when I get into supply chain, um, our philosophy about having at least two providers for all the major components. But we have worked very closely with both of these teams. They are working together actually. And um, we're really trying to get their input into the design, the manufacturability, fabrication, and costs and schedule um, early before we finish final design so that we feel it will give us a much better estimate on what we believe the final cost and schedule will be for the plant. Uh, next slide. Um, so suppliers, uh, let me talk a little bit about our guiding principles for suppliers. Um, we started again very early on in 2018, um, talking to potential suppliers um, we talked about strategic sourcing and um, how do we minimize the number of key vendors and engage with them early so they are involved in the design process. We looked at the components and the subsystems that we were designing and wanted to make sure that as in as many as we possibly could, that we had two to three suppliers um, for each of those um, subsystems and components. And part of the reason was not to depend on one source for any particular part. Another part is, you know, if we're really going to be successful on employing the amount of reactors that we think we're going to need in the future, we're going to need more than, you know, uh, Tara talked about the supply base, we're going to need more than one supplier. Um, and so we were very emphatic about that. And what you see here is the list of the suppliers that we are currently working with. Um, and we are about 90% um, through locking down our supplier base um, with having about two, supply, one, two to three suppliers on every um, uh, system. Um, next chart. So the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program was, is a really, really key component, uh, program for us. And uh, it was a $1.2 billion 50-50 cost share program that uh, we signed up for, and it does include two components. One is the construction of the first commercial uh, scale four pack plant. So it's four reactors generating 320 megawatts. And then the second is to build a commercial triso fuel facility, which we are uh, building in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Next chart. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple of our accomplishments. Um, that we've had over the past couple of years where we signed the contract March 2021. Um, we are through what's called basic design uh, that ended at the end of 22. Um, and now we're at the point what we're calling kind of value design where we are sending drawings to a number of our manufacturers to get feedback on cost manufacturability and really understand what those costs are. Um, on the financing side, we completed uh, series B fundraising in 2021 and really spent most of 2022 on a series C fundraising. And as many of you probably have heard, we announced that we will be going public as a company uh, sometime this year. 
I'll talk a little bit more about licensing. We've, uh, we've been engaged with the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, since 2018 and the formal pre-licensing process. Um, just wanted to point out two things in the pictures. They're not very exciting, but they're important to us. Um, the first top one is called the uh, burn-up measurement system. Very, very important uh, system for us. Um, I talked about the pebbles coming up and being able to evaluate the amount of fuel that's still left in there. Um, that's a prototype of what that system would look like. And then our reaction protection system is um, shown below that. And we do have um, a, a full scale of that in our facility in Rockville, uh, working with our digital twin that we have up there as well. Um, and then uh, I said, we announced our constructors in July and then March 1st, just uh, last week ago, we did announce an adding, adding Dow as a subawardee to the ARDP program and are evaluating potential sites. Next slide. Um, the regulatory process, as I said, we began pre-application in 2018 for both the reactor and the fuel. So they really go through two separate different, two separate processes. Um, so let me talk about the fuel first. Um, it's part 70. We submitted our application to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in April of this year. They accepted the, let's see, it was the first category two commercial application that the NRC has received. Um, and they accepted the application in December and told us that they expect the review to take about 30 months. They held their first public meeting January 25th of 2023. On the reactor side, we will be submitting um, part 50 and we have done and submitted seven topical reports, seven white papers, and anticipate submitting our construction application uh, by the end of this year. Next slide. Um, this is, I had mentioned that we got our first contract from the Department of Energy in 2016. Um, this is our pilot facility for our commercial fuel facility. Um, it is currently up and operating since 2018 at Oak Ridge National Lab. They gave us about 8,000 square feet of space. Um, it is capable of making the uranium kernels, the coating of the, um, of the kernels um, with silicon, carbide, and graphite, and then forming uh, uh, the particles into the pebble shape that we'll use in the pebble bed reactor. We do have a capability of doing more shape forms with trisome fuel than just the pebble. Um, but it's been a great experience, a great uh, learning capability for us. What we did is take all our, what we decided we were gonna do commercially and bought all commercial size equipment of the equipment that we will use in our commercial manufacturing facility. So that, and we've had NRC interacting with us really since 2018, 2019. So what we're doing in the large scale manufacturing facility is replicating the lines. So we don't have to scale anything up. We don't have to deal with different equipment that we've been using. It's all the same equipment and uh, we just will greatly enhance the lines that um, we'll be making. So just if you think about it um, in terms of our reactor and the first plant, we put about 220,000 pebbles, as I said, into each reactor. We've got a four pack, so we will need about a million pebbles um, for our first plant uh, to begin operations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this just shows a, a graphic design of what our uh, commercial facility will look like. And we did a groundbreaking down at Oak Ridge on October 13th of last year. And we expect it to be operational in 2025, which gives us enough time to uh, manufacture a million pebbles. Um, next slide, please. Um, we, we, we did get an award in 2019 timeframe from ARPA-E for a digital twin. So what you see on the left, the control room in, in Rockville, Maryland, is what we currently have operating. And actually all the way over on the left is the, um, uh, the uh, protection system. And um, 
what we have now decided to do with the, uh, you know, having it up and operating for the past couple of years is to actually build out a training and operations center. So what you see on the right-hand side is what that would graphically look like. We have rented a building in Frederick, Maryland, and this will actually be the training center for our entire fleet. We'll have people come in, they may stay there for six months to go through a training program, and then they would be um, sent to the particular reactors that they're gonna be working on. So that's a concept we have right now for training our operators. Um, next slide, that's just an overview of what we look at, uh, how we envision our plant looking um, completed. Uh, next one. Um, during construction, we think the plan will probably have require or uh, will probably uh, require about 800 to 1,200 jobs. And then during operations, we'll probably be at about 100 to 200 jobs. Next slide. Um, I think Tara talked a little bit about this too. What we um, have that we think is a great advantage is our ability to um, load follow. And we do it not in our reactor core, but we do it on the conventional island side of the plant, but with, um, with the steam generator. So this is a really attractive feature to utilities that are adding you know, lots of um, uh, renewable power onto their, uh, and intermittent power onto their grids. We can uh, go from 100% down to 40% in about 12 minutes and ramp up at the same pace. So um, it's something that uh, is really favorable as we look to where fossil fuel plants have been that have performed uh, this kind of function. And we really haven't had the ability to do this with nuclear plants. Next slide. Um, the other thing I mentioned, we produce steam as well as electricity. And the steam comes out of our reactor um, at 565 degrees Celsius. So what this just shows is there are a lot of industrial processes that use steam for manufacturing. In fact, about 35% of the energy use in this country is in the industrial processes. So if we can decarbonize that sector as well as the electric sector, um, we will be making a huge contribution to reaching climate change mitigation strategies and, uh, and achieving decarbonization. So it's a very high priority. We think there's a lot of applications um, for petroleum project, uh, products, mining operations, and hydrogen production. And so that's something that's a high priority that we are pursuing. The next slide. Um, and just covering this quickly, we have, um, you know, we do see coal plant um, sites as very strongly an opportunity to put nuclear reactors, these smaller modular reactors. Um, and we do think we can be competitive on the steam side and then eventually um, on the production of hydrogen. Next slide. I'm gonna to change to politics for a second and I'm gonna talk for a couple of minutes on politics. I believe we are in a, in a historical um, unparalleled time um, in the past five years in terms of the support of uh, uh, advanced reactors. It's really been quite remarkable on a bipartisan level to have um, the type of support we've had both in funding and policy making um, that we've had. And it has transitioned from the end of the Obama administration through the Trump administration and into the Biden administration. Next slide. Um, you know, when I first started in 2015, 2016 is when the first two bills were introduced, the, uh, what's known as NECA and NEMA, the uh, Innovation and Capabilities Act and the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act. And, you know, those bills passed and became law in 2018. And when they did, I thought, wow, you know, the Congress is going to think that they have done a lot for um, advanced reactors. But you know what we're trying to do in terms of deploying reactors is challenging. There's lots of obstacles. And um, it's really been remarkable how the Congress has been what I call policy forward. I think they're ahead of the public perception on this, but they really understand the role that nuclear energy can play. 
Um, you know, they've they've addressed um, forward funding um, in the infrastructure bill for ARDP. They um, provided tax credits for, um, that really treat nuclear energy like uh, solar and wind and other renewables in the Investment Reduction Act. Um, they've provided funding for HALU, which we're in the same situation Terra Power is in our need for HALU. And they're continuing to talk about other areas of licensing reform. How do we adequately export this technology, both on the financing side and the regulatory side? They're doing work in microreactors and looking at hybrid system. And it's amazing. You go talk to um, one of the members, you know, and staff that are introducing a new bill in this area, and they say, well, we want to make sure we have it as a bipartisan bill. So despite everything else that's going on in this country and partisanship, um, nuclear and advanced nuclear energy has remained and continues to remain very strongly a bipartisan effort. Next. Um, we are also seeing a huge amount of momentum in the states. Um, the light color green are states that currently have operating plants and the dark colored green are states where policies are under consideration. And um, it's really been in the past three, four years that um, there's been a major shift in repealing moratoriums, bills that are providing incentives for advanced reactors to site there, um, and then regulatory framework works that are being either revised or put in place and providing funding for things like feasibility studies. So it's really been um, evolved quite quickly, particularly in the last two years. Next slide. So I just want to end, this is also a very interesting uh, uh, time we're in where terrestrial commercial energy is really fueling um, a lot of innovation in space nuclear power. We were the recipient recently um, with one of our other companies, Intuitive Machines, um, to design uh, for one of the design contracts for the fission surface power. Um, we will be, as a country, going back to the moon. Um, if you go back to the moon to stay, the lunar night is 14 Earth days, so nuclear power has to be a part of the equation. Um, and the Russians and the Chinese are going there. The Chinese have talked about a one megawatt reactor on the surface of the moon. So we're, we're seeing a lot of competition and we're gonna see an extension um, of nuclear power into space using um, probably halo fuel and triso fuel, which people view as, as you know, one of the safest forms. Um, and the same goes for transportation to Mars, that if you can get there in a much shorter period of time, your risk to astronauts reduces significantly. So we're involved in both aspects of those. Um, so I'm gonna conclude by just saying, you know, we talk about, you know, the last slide, um, power density in nuclear energy. So, and I've talked a lot about our little pebble. Um, so just to give you an example, our pebble has enough electricity or thermal power in it to power an electric car 98,000 miles, which is four times the circumference of the earth or two thirds of the way to the moon. And with that, I'll end. Thank you so much, Carol. Again, a lot uh, packed into your presentation. Um, and we really appreciate it. We will take one quick question from you. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll open the floor up um, and we'll sort of alternate um, questions. So Carol, <clears throat> we've got one in the chat for you um, and that's from Fatma Yilmaz. Um, the question is, what is the expected cost of electricity from these new reactor designs on a dollar per megawatt hour basis? Um, so we think we can, you know, our goal is to be competitive um, in the, so the, uh, for the electricity side, our goal is to be competitive with current sources and we're aiming for $60 a megawatt hour. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we will have the general question answer period um, and we have just about 10 minutes left here. Is that right, Tamara? About 10 minutes, I think so. Okay. Um, about 15, you have about 15 minutes. 
15. Okay, good. Um, well, Tamara does want to take her a, a few minutes to wrap up at the end, but I realize, I recognize, I told you all in the audience that I was going straight down the list. And I think there's one that I missed that came in before um, Paul's uh, for Tara. And that is how are costs saved by separating the nuclear island from the turbine and generator and roughly how many how many dollars were saved by doing so? Uh, so we're in the process of, of doing a um, class three, four estimate right now. So um, our, our cost, how much we are saving, um, I can't really provide to you, but we should be able to make that public relatively soon. Um, the, the real reason that um, we can uh, save money by separating out the energy in the nuclear island is um, you have to build under nuclear conditions on the nuclear island, but the energy island is all commercial grade. So um, it basically bought off the shelf type um, equipment, um, a, lot less, uh, a lot less expensive. It's on the order of a factor of three when you go between nuclear and commercial. Okay, thank you. And that was from Michael, forgive me for butchering the name, it's Watertick. Um, okay, so uh, Eunice, do we have any hands raised before I move on to more chat-based questions? Nope, no hand raises. All right, um, I'm gonna go to, let's see. Here's a question for both Terra Power and X Energy. Are there any considerations in the near or long term for either of your firms to manufacture, manufacture and or use reprocess fuel? And Carol, did you wanna take that first? Sure. Um, so um, I will say just in terms of um, burn up, I mean, we, as I said, our, our fuel goes through the reactor um, on average probably six times. And so we really have a very, very high degree of burn up of our fuel. Um, but at the present time, we do not have plans to use reprocessed fuel as, as the fuel for our reactor. Tara, do you have any comments on that? Sure. Um, and so uh, I think you asked two questions. One is whether or not uh, we would be reprocessing um, in our reactor, and and we could do that if we if we chose to do so. We have chosen to do a once through cycle, um, and the reason for that is the added cost of recycling um, really outweighs the benefits. We believe. Um, however, that does not mean that we wouldn't be able to use reprocessed fuel. Um, the the big challenge is there is as you use reprocessed fuel um, because of the impurities in that you have to provide a lot of shielding in your fuel fabrication facility so it is a different kind of facility that you'd have to um, have to build um, so we do not have any current plans to do that um, however that doesn't mean we wouldn't do that in the future okay and trying to keep up with the names here that one was also from michael um, so the next one, Carol, is for you. That's from Tamara. Can you discuss your company's prospects in the international market and the opportunities you see there? Um, so we've seen early on um, over the past several years that the there's a really distinct window um, in uh, many of the international markets over the next 10 years, 10 to 15 years, um, that we found um, you know, that allows for both countries that want to get off coal, countries that um, haven't been nuclear uh, operators before, but are interested in it now. So we have been in discussions internationally over the past five years. Um, I think what's changed uh, this year, uh, this past year with uh, the war that's been going on and the increased focus on energy security is putting I, I think accelerating the interest in terms of the international markets. So we are seeing a lot more of that. I think one of the challenges that um, we face that we're continuing to work is that, you know, making sure that the regulators on the international in the international community are familiar and you know are educated on the non-light water reactor technologies. You know, some of the countries like the UK and Canada 
are familiar with it, but some of the countries in particular that have not been uh, previous operators of nuclear um, or you know, really just have experience in you know, one or two reactor, light water reactors, uh, may not have um, the staffing or the, you know, the knowledge base on non-light water reactors. So that's something that we're working on as well. Sarah, did you want to speak to that at all? Sort of the sure. Um, we've been a, a, a bit conservative on the uh, business development side of the house. We want to make sure that we um, have, uh, you know, are successful on the demonstration um, and, and would do more of our, um, our uh, business development really in terms of, of uh, after we submit our license application. Um, that being said, um, and we do think that there is a uh, good, a great need for, um, for this type of reactor around the world. And we are focusing primarily in the United States, but also in, in areas that um, are uh, US friendly countries, if you will, like Japan and the UK and, uh, and uh, Western Europe. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, Tara, this one's for you. Uh, there's a question from Kathleen Fonville. Um, are there any erosion concerns using sodium? Actually, um, that's the amazing thing about sodium. <laughs> sodium uh, is, is, as long as you keep it pure, you know, you can get contaminants and such, which, which could probably be, could be a problem, but sodium has no corrosion issues. Um, sodium is, is um, it works really, really well with uh, stainless and carbon steel. Um, with the FFTF reactor, which predecessor reactor that was built on the Hanford site, um, when they uh, looked inside their piping, um, there were they could still see the original markings uh, during construction on the pipes. There was absolutely no corrosion, um, and uh, and we have a um, sodium purification process as part of our our, our uh, design uh, that keeps the impurities um, to a minimum. So uh, we do not think that there's a corrosion issue whatsoever with the sodium. Okay, um, Eunice, any hands raised? Want to go to those people if they are there? No hands raised. Okay, uh, so Carol, uh, we have a question for you from Georgette Alexander Morrison. Uh, what are the technology challenges that X, X Energy um, and well, Terra Power for that matter as well are experiencing? So Carol, if you'd like to take that one first. Um, I think our biggest challenge, because we really, from a technology standpoint, we're not really being driven um, in terms of new technology, but the challenge is to make sure that we can do it affordable and manufacture and, and being able to manufacture it at a cost um, that will end up being, um, you know, compatible and, and meet the, uh, the desires of our customers. So, um, so I wouldn't say there were technology challenges per se. I think it's, you know, as we look to what do we need to be successful overall for advanced reactors, you know, there's the technology element, there's um, a delivery model, um, which is what, <coughs> excuse me, Tara and I have been talking about in terms of being able to, um, create more economical systems on the nuclear or the non-nuclear part of the reactor. And there's the regulatory framework of going through the regulatory process for the first time. So I think it's really the combination of those and making sure that they all interact to end up with a product that we will be able to get to market on cost and on schedule is probably the, the challenge overall. And I would concur with Carol is that's absolutely uh, the the most fundamental um, aspect of the of the design is keeping it cost effective, um, and we do have some uh, licensing innovations that um, uh, that do require work. I don't think that they're impossible to uh, to manage, but they they are um, somewhat challenging. As one is, we are doing a functional containment, so we do need to um, prove that that's an acceptable method for through the NRC. Um, 
uh, we have some seismic challenges in Kemmerer. Um, they, they, and uh, we do also, it's, uh, I think it's within 200 miles of um, Old Faithful. So, so we do have to analyze for volcanic ash, um, you know, so, so we're doing all those things. We don't see any showstoppers, but uh, um, there, you know, there's a trade-off between, do you want to do seismic isolation of equipment or do you want to make your containment, um, you know, heavier? Um, so we are making those technical decisions now. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a moment, I'm actually going to scroll back down here. There's one that I wanted to get for you, Carol. Um, this one is from Stacy O'Connell. Um, and this is a, a question about feedback that you're receiving from the public concerning using nuclear in a peak load strategy. Um, so what does that feedback look like? Um, let's see, and, and the last part of it is that the public, public is used to nuclear plants being base loaded. Um, so load following is really going to be dependent on the customer and how they use it within the way they distribute the energy. So it's not necessarily going to be off and on for the same amount of time for each customer. It really will depend on what their mix is and when they need it and, and all of that. So we, um, you know, we have the te technical capability to do that. Um, and then it'll end up being a decision by uh, the utility on how they will end up deploying it. Uh, we have not had public hearings at this point yet, um, so I don't have any direct feedback from the public on that. Um, it really, I think what we're going to see is the utilities making the decisions on how they can deploy the various power generation sources they have most economically that will um, end up being the probably lowest cost for the rate payers. Um, but so that's really the strategy and it will depend on each of those individual customers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tara, this one is for you and I think we're gonna have to round it out. I, there's one that I wanted to ask both of you just quickly, but for you, Tara, this last one is uh, Renee Sullivan, considering the reactors underground, what safeguards are in place for the protection of groundwater? Um, everything is contained. Um, so uh, there's, and there's no uh, penetrations in the reactor vessel. So we don't anticipate any leak there's no way for it to leak because there's you know normally where there's a leak there's a weld or there's a or there's a, a penetration in the reactor um, I'm sure we'll have monitoring um, that is typical of, of uh, nuclear sites uh, to ensure that there is no release but uh, we don't anticipate that um, and really we've precluded those leaks by the design itself Thank you. And I know I'm just taking the liberty here because this is, I think, an important question. And maybe you could just give two sentences on it. I know it doesn't do it justice, but it's a question about the what challenges you've seen in the nuclear work, workforce. Um, and I know you probably both have a little bit of something to say about that. Uh, Carol, do you want to start or you want me to start? Sure. Um, yeah, so I talked a little bit about the fact that we've gone from, um, you know, uh, uh, beginning of COVID, I think we were about 70 people. And um, as I said, we're now at about over uh, 400, um, 420. We'll be at 500 at the end of this year. And so it's we're growing very rapidly. Um, and we probably have 1,000 people that are part of our suppliers of contractor base. Um, it's very challenging because we're all growing kind of at the same time. And so there's a huge demand out there for the workforce. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we're all trying to adapt to as well is looking at, you know, you don't, necess not, you don't necessarily need to be a nuclear engineer for all the disciplines that we're doing in designing and um, delivering the systems. And so we are, we have a number of aerospace engineers, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, um, uh, electrical, uh, very, all various disciplines. So it is very challenging. And, you know, it's the same time the Nuclear Regulatory Commission 
is um, staffing up and the lads are staffing up. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very demanding market. Um, and so we're just, we're, you're, we're trying to get as much, as many people as we can get with the skills that we need, recognizing that they may come from different areas than they've come from in the past. Thank you, Cara. Tara, did you have anything you wanted to add? Sure, um, and we've grown very rapidly too. I think um, overall the company is now at about 600 um, or we will be at 600 employees by the end of this year. Uh, we're over 400 um, and now and, we've, and uh, we also supplement that with a tremendous amount of staff augmentation um, as well. Uh, we've been able to attract very capable people. I think um, I think the advanced reactors, um, at least the leading ones like X Energy and TerraPower, uh, have been able to get very good people um, in house uh, because it's something that um, is driven by the heart. That people actually want to do this kind of work because you can save the planet. So it's so it's it's really exciting in that regard. I am concerned though in terms of the labor force and the construction. Uh, and also the labor force to um, to be the operators of these plants. Um, you know, we're in a fairly remote site, um, how we're going to attract those people. So we're putting plans in place now on that and it is challenging. Um, and, you know, that's why we're we're looking at um, some of the things that we're gonna have to do to incentivize people to, to come here, in, including looking at um, the groups that are underrepresented uh, like the tribal nations. Thank you so much to both of you, both Carol and Tara. We really appreciate your, uh, the depth of your presentations um, and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. I will now turn it over to Tamara for the closeout. Well, I too would like to thank Carol and Tara for joining us today and sharing such insightful information. And thank you as well, Stephanie, for moderating. And mostly I wanted to thank all of you who attended today and you took time out of your busy schedules to join in the conversation and to help us celebrate the women and tell our stories. There are several more events planned throughout the month, so please check the US WIND website for registration information. In fact, the second um, session of our technical webinar series is scheduled on March 28th, and it's advancing isotope science and research application and industrial use, including new reactor start startup. And finally, um, feedback is a gift. So after you leave today's webinar, a survey should automatically pop up as you close out. So please take a few minutes to complete it so we know how we're doing and if we're meeting your needs. And if the survey doesn't pop up, please check your email because Zoom may automatically send it there. So with that, thank you again and have a great week. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat>